conflict is a dynamic and personal endeavour. And the, the human nature of the endeavour means that it is fast moving and requires adaptation. Humans, when in conflict, adapt or they die. Technology helps that. Um, we like technology in, in militaries uh, because it allows us to keep out of harm's way further distance from the other bloke. It allows us to do things at greater range with greater accuracy and let's not avoid the subject more lethally. But the technology edge is disappearing. And this is because education standards and the passage of information around the world are, are better than they've been. Uh, and the monopoly that Western industrialised nations have had does not exist any longer. That doesn't mean that technology is not important. It is important, as you'll see. Uh, but what you can't afford to do, as we have done in the past, is rely on your industrial strength or mass or technology on its own to try and get you out of trouble. Uh, what I'm now going to do is, is show you about half a dozen types of technology that we're interested in the future and briefly why it is we're interested in it and, and where the shortcomings might be. The fact is that in 15 minutes, uh, it's literally going to be a wave top uh, discussion. And for those scientists among you who feel that your pet subject or PhD is being treated by the casual disdain that only an international politics graduate can bring, and the answer is, you're bloody right, suck it up. <laughs> <laughs> um, the first thing we're interested in here is uh, the big data and the Internet of Things. The reason for this is that if we can monitor human beings, and before you think that's a bit 1984, think about what you see on the back of international rugby players' shirts at the moment, the little tag on the back that monitors how their body is doing and what their physiology says. And if you can do that to, human, uh, to, to vehicles and other machines, and most of those of you who've got cars will have uh, computers in them which give that, just that sort of data, then we can provision, take care and maintain better across a wider range and more efficiently. Um, and this makes things cheaper, it makes things more effective, it makes things more efficient. Now, for those of you who've started to notice the photographs, there will be some sort of transitional uh, benefit, you might think, to uh, being able to turn the central heating on in your house from the top of your tank. But think about it in a different way. Uh, if you want to go to, uh, to the back to the, the black adder um, uh, type of analogy, um, there is a chance that as you sit in the top of your tank and declare victory, and you rush off for tea and medals that you can actually turn on the teas made from the top of your tank when you're back at home. For those of you who don't know what a teas made is, you can find them in most car boot sales. <laughs> but you have to be over 30 to remember what they are. There are a variety of different ways you can contend that, that human beings can augment it, can be augmented. Um, there's a pharmacological angle to this, uh, which is best illustrated by sportsmen taking steroids. But clearly there are, there are other ways of, of changing both physical and indeed cognitive um, qualities inside a human being. There's also uh, the prospect of, of genetic alteration. Uh, personally, and I, I don't think anybody would disagree with me, I don't see that sort of uh, behaviour or product being acceptable in Western societies, either morally or ethic ethically. But we have to be interested in it because we don't know what other people are going to do and how it is that if you face somebody who does have this kind of alteration, what, what they're going to be able to do or not going to be able to do. So it's something we have to be able to investigate. The prosthetics and cybernetics side are, are quite interesting, not because you can say, I feel a bit of a wimp, saw my arm off, arm off and I'll have a bionic one. It's because if you've been injured and have had a life-changing injury, then the advances in that sort of technology bring real benefits. Uh, and I listened on Tuesday to the, the Vice Chief of the American Army, who spoke with, with some pride uh, about gripping and shaking the hand, almost to the point of submission of a Medal of Honor winner who got a bionic hand, having had his own blown off in Afghanistan. So the sort of technology that, that you've been led to envisage by television programs is beginning to come online. The last one is the picture you saw at the beginning, which is the exos uh, exoskeletons which does give uh, the opportunity for greater lift uh, and greater endurance in, in, in the right sort of environment. 
but you can see that it has limitations in that uh, would you really want, on the basis of human contact, to come across a soldier looking like that in the field if you're in some sort of internal security operation or, or some sort of policing action? It ha will no doubt have its place, but it's not something that I think has, has uh, universal applicability. Th there is a difference which you probably need to grasp between um, unmanned and autonomous. What we mean by an unmanned system is one that has got a man in the loop somewhere. It doesn't have a pilot or a driver on board, but there's someone behind a television set some way away controlling it. Drones, uh, drone strikes are an example. What you mean by autonomous is something that, that doesn't have a man controlling it. It's pre-programmed to act in a certain way and, and given a certain set of behaviours. Uh, and the benefits of these are broadly twofold. The first one is it keeps, again, humans out of harm's way. You can see from the business of the drone strike, impersonal as you may find them, that if you put one of these things above a target area, you don't have to expose a human being in an aeroplane to do it. Uh, that does come with penalties, but nevertheless, uh, you're not exposing a pilot. The other thing that it does is, uh, and this is particularly with the autonomous systems, is it means that you don't have to uh, commit as many human beings to the physical act of driving or piloting something. So you can envisage vehicles, and this technology exists, where you can run an entire convoy with either one person at the front in the lead vehicle and none of the other vehicles manned, or uh, a limited number of drivers in each of the vehicles such that you don't have to change shifts every, every 12 hours or what are the driving regulations are. And the same thing runs for aeroplanes. The problems with pilots, great blokes that they are, is that you can only fly an aeroplane for so many hours before you get too tired and it falls out of the sky. Uh, you can't keep a, keep a person doing it for more than uh, a certain number of hours at a time before you then have to give them crew rest. Uh, you have to keep them current, and therefore they have to do a certain amount of expensive training. If you have autonomous systems, that's not the case. Um, so therefore it gives you that kind of economy. What it doesn't give you, although it is true to say that if you're in a modern aeroplane, um, the pilot may be the weak link in terms of how fast it can go and how quickly it can turn. But actually, a small agile missile is always going to outturn an aeroplane. It's always going to outrun an aeroplane. And therefore, the big issue is, do I have to expose a pilot at all? And do I have to train expensive pilots when actually there's a less expensive way of doing it? The trouble with uh, those sort of systems is, rather like the, the big data and the internet of things, it's very, very dependent on um, bandwidth, how much, how big the pipe is down which you've got to send all these electrical signals and how big the pipe is to get all the information back. And that has a, a power um, implication and you all know about that anyway because on your mobile phones the bigger, cleverer and more exotic your applications are, the quicker your phone runs out of battery. Uh, and it's precisely the same problem here. Um, when I was twisting the arm of the scientist who was telling me about this in order to work out what the hell quantum technologies were, because it's one of those glib things that, exp uh, that explodes off the tongue. Um, he described it as the, um, uh, those bits of science which are difficult to explain um, with uh, classic laws of physics, such as Newton's form of uh, laws of motion. I then pointed out to him I could have read that on Wikipedia, and he looked quite crestfallen. Um, the sort of things that we're, we're looking at here um, relate to technologies such as clocks. If you can use quantum clocks, develop quantum clocks which are so much more accurate, then you have an opportunity not to be a slave to GPS. The problem with the global positioning system is it's based on satellites and electrical signals which can be jammed very easily. If you can find something which works better on inertial navigation, which is a system which sits within the vehicle and works on timing, then you can be much more accurate without being a slave to, to the satellites and therefore open to the vulnerability of jamming. If you then turn that to uh, encryption and communications, you have a situation where they, people will begin to claim that you can make codes that are almost unbreakable. You've just heard about Bletchley Park. Um, the, the opportunity here is digital encoding, which you cannot break which is extremely important given that actually if you come the other way with some of the quantum computing we've got, that the existing codes are becoming eminently breakable. And the last type of opportunity is the sensing technology, uh, where I'm, I'm told that 
if you are clever about how you are able to detect gravitational differences, you can physically use sensors to look through solid objects like walls. Now, all these are significant changes over what we have at the moment and offer great opportunities. The issue here is how fast can you develop this technology uh, and how as expensive is it going to be when you, when you get there. You've heard a lot about 3D printing, normally because of the slight red herring of, of being able to manufacture guns and get them past police cordons and into the hands of terrorists. You can do that and you've just seen a picture of one. Really, the, the benefits of 3D printing illustrated by this, which I, I understand is an actual part manufactured by BAE Systems to go into an aeroplane, is that it allows you the prospect of a much reduced logistic footprint uh, dispersed over a wider area. You can conceive of being able to supply people in forward locations without having to run convoys in to resupply them with goods. It gives you the, the opportunity of running on uh, older equipment longer um, because you're not slave to someone keeping their expensive production line open. Um, there are advantages, but at the moment we're in a position where this stuff is actually uh, not particularly quick, it absorbs a lot of power, it doesn't do mixed material or materials where the crystalline structure changes particularly well. So there is some way to go on it, but you can see that when this is absolutely developed, it, it will offer you uh, an awful lot of opportunities. Uh, I really want to see this one work. Uh, th this is the notion that you can have a, um, uh, a computer uh, which not only um, simultaneously translates for you, uh, but the faster and cleverer it gets, uh, the better it might be at actually interpreting tone, attitude and body language. Um, I was sufficiently lucky in, in a tour I did a few years ago to be allocated my own um, driver and vehicle. Uh, I was lucky because he was a thoroughly decent human being and a good bloke to spend time with. Uh, but he did cement my view that there is no computer on earth that is capable of translating Glaswegian into Serbo-Croat. <laughs> uh, and actually, why on earth would you want to translate when you can see body language in front of you already? Um, the fact is that... that Having something like this will not obviate the requirement for people to understand or learn languages or for us to have interpreters. But the fact is that when you do go into uh, new environments that uh, you don't always have access uh, to people who speak the language um, or somebody uh, in your patrol who, who is a fluent speaker. Uh, and therefore anything like this is going to make that initial contact much, much more easy. It has limitations. Human contact and the ability to speak is, is just that and has its benefits. But, but this sort of application, this sort of uh, capability promises much. But I said at the beginning that, that technology is not everything, and that is the case. Uh, innovation is not just invention. It, it's, the, the means of, it's the matter of taking those inventions and mixing them with understanding, with culture and with education. Innovation is about problem solving. It's not about just inventing something to get yourself out of trouble. We saw that uh, from the girls' slide. Industry and application of industrial power does not work in all circumstances. and It certainly doesn't work to any great extent these days. But the paradox we face in the military and in any big organisation is that the big organisations are not the best media through which uh, you stimulate innovation. Because innovation th thrives best uh, where there is a lack of conformity, where there is an understanding that failure is inevitable, uh, and where it's tolerated and people are then encouraged to go on. Now, as taxpayers, you may feel thoroughly assured that the military doesn't fail that often. Um, but on the other hand, if you want to innovate, you've got to be prepared to tolerate it. So technology is important. I've shown you half a dozen examples of, of what it is we're doing and why it is we're doing it, but it is not the be-all and end-all. It has to be combined with proper innovation, um, with a proper change in culture, and with a proper requirement and willingness to adapt, because that's what actually gives you an advantage. Thank you very, Thank you very much. much.